Welcome to this module, Understanding Measurement Properties. My name is Alan Heinemann, and joining me today is Jennifer Moore. Also contributing to the module is Alan Kozlowski. After this module, you should be able to answer the following questions. What is inter-rater reliability? What is internal consistency? What is test-retest reliability? What measurement properties should clinical outcome instruments demonstrate for interpreting a score at a single point in time? for prediction of a future event, for interpreting change over two or more time points. How are minimally clinically important differences, or the MCID, indices of value to clinicians? And how do MCIDs differ from minimal detectable change indices? We will also cover sources of error. At completion of this module, you will understand uh, the sources of error that exist in patient reported instruments, and for clinician rated instruments. And we'll also discuss potential sources of bias and what you can do in the clinic to reduce measurement error and potential for bias. In your clinic, what aspects of clinical utility will affect use of a patient reported instrument administered electronically, a clinician rated instrument that takes about 20 minutes for a typical patient? Measurement and rehabilitation clinics provides a means of understanding important differences within and between our patients in order to facilitate decisions to help patients improve or retain the ability to function in their lives. We can organize our clinical decisions that depend on measurement into three broad categories. First, we discriminate states or levels of function at a point in time. We do this in our initial assessment to determine eligibility for services, rule in or out competing underlying problems to ensure safety and to establish a baseline for future change. Second, we measure to plan by predicting the risk of future events, such as fall risk for an elderly patient over the next three or six month period. And third, we measure to evaluate our treatment outcomes, which requires measuring change in important aspects of functioning through our interventions. We use these processes to plan an intervention and discharge and provide information to patients, their families, and members of the care team and others. Although we want to use an instrument that is valid and reliable, it is important to understand whether the instrument is feasible to administer under the constraints of a clinical practice setting. Common elements of clinical utility include the cost of the instrument, training required to administer the instrument, the time required to administer an instrument, the type of measure, whether it's patient reported or clinician rated, the burden of the measure to the clinician and to the patient, and the resources required, such as clinical space and equipment and instrument specific requirements, and then also organizational constraints. The clinical record management system is an example of an organizational factor. A paper-based system might permit flexibility in selecting instruments, but increase the administrative burden to the clinician. An electronic medical record might reduce the burden by streamlining data entry, but constrain the clinician to instruments that have been included in the system. Administrative burden is also related to the type of instrument used. Patient-rated instruments are questionnaires that can be administered with little or no burden to the clinician, whereas clinician-rated instruments require the clinician to administer, score, and interpret the measurement. Rehabilitation measures can be grouped into two general categories based on how they are administered. Clinician-rated performance instruments require a clinician to directly observe as the patient completes the required task or tasks. They include instruments like timed walk tests, where the clinician monitors the time taken to walk a fixed distance or measures the distance walked over a fixed time. The clinician may also observe the patient's quality of movement. The executive function performance test is another example. This test requires the clinician to observe and rate the patient's performance of a set of instrumental activities of daily living as an assessment of cognitive functioning. Patient reported outcomes are questionnaires that patients complete. They include instruments like function and disability questionnaires, PROMISE, which is the patient reported outcome measurement information system, NeuroQual, the neurological quality of life measures. Clinician rated and patient reported instruments do not measure the same thing. Like two sides of a coin, two comparable tests may measure the same construct, 
but from two different perspectives. Having scores from both clinician and patient perspectives can facilitate decision making. Improvement over time on both tests may indicate continuing or advancing of the rehabilitation plan. Little or no change may provide support for the discharge plan. Deterioration on both tests or discrepancy between them may indicate the rehabilitation plan is off track and requires reevaluation. Discrepancies between clinicians and patients promote discussion about different perspectives. As we move through this module, we will refer to a patient case and discuss clinical utility and psychometric properties in reference to this patient's case. The patient that we will discuss today is Frank. Frank is a 72-year-old male with Parkinson's disease of seven years duration. Frank has Parkinson's disease classified as Honinger stage three, which indicates bilateral Parkinson's symptoms with mild to moderate disability and impaired postural reflexes. This stage also indicates that Frank is currently still physically independent, but demonstrating increased severity of symptoms. Frank lives independently with his wife, who is 70 years old. Because of health concerns, his wife is unable to physically assist him with mobility. Frank is being assessed in a Parkinson's clinic for potential admission into inpatient rehabilitation. His chief complaint is that he is experiencing frequent falls while standing and ambulating. He also reports decreased mobility, the instability, and greater dependence in ADLs and IADLs. Frank's primary goal is to reduce his fall risk. His secondary goals are to increase independence and mobility and ADLs. The PD clinic in which Frank is being assessed includes a 60-minute evaluation. At the end of the eva evaluation, a determination of whether rehabilitation is appropriate must be made. If it is appropriate, the level of care must be recommended by the evaluating therapist. The clinicians would like to investigate various instruments that could assist them with decision making, and they plan to implement them into routine practice. Since Frank case is similar to many of the cases they see, the clinicians are evaluating instruments specifically for Frank, but think the selected measures may be appropriate for many of the patients they assess. For the purposes of this presentation, we are going to focus on psychometrics, clinical utility, and indices of change of the instruments instead of the details about the actual content of the instruments. From Frank's history, we expect to find deficits balance, gait, or both, and we want to be able to monitor change over time. If our rehabilitation interventions are successful, we expect to see improvements in balance, gait, or both over a few months. Over the long term, we also want to be able to monitor for deterioration given that the natural course of Parkinson's disease. We also want to know that balance deficits have been associated with risk of falling. Since a fall-related injury could complicate Frank's ability to maintain independence, our first concern is determining Frank's fall risk. For the purposes of this presentation, we are going to focus the instrument selection around static and dynamic balance since reduction of falls is the most critical concern at this point. It is also Frank's primary goal. Let's return to the Rehabilitation Measures database that was introduced in an earlier module. The URL, rehabmeasures.org, takes you to the screenshot that you see here. The selection options we have, first, under Area of Measurement, is to select Balance, Non-Vestibular. For Diagnosis, we select Parkinson's Disease. For Length of Test, we select No Preference. And for the purposes today, for cost, we want only free tests. The search results in five balance tests. The Berg balance test, the dynamic gait index, timed up and go, the activity specific balance confidence scale, and the functional reach test. Now we wonder which of these five instruments will be best for us to use to measure Frank's balance. Please note that a more thorough review of balance measures should be considered if you are interested in reviewing instruments for a similar case. We have narrowed a longer list to these five instruments for demonstration purposes only. In Frank's case, we need to find an instrument that will allow us to assess current fall risk, track changes in balance over time, and accurately assess areas that balance is reportedly deficient. Listed within this table are elements of clinical utility for five instruments that were produced in our rehabilitation measures search. Of the instruments listed, the Berg Balance Scale is the only instrument that assesses both static and dynamic balance. This is important to note since Frank reported his falls occur while both standing and walking.
Additionally, all of the instruments are clinician rated, with the exception of the activity-specific balance confidence scale, which is a patient-reported outcome measure. There are benefits to using both patient-reported and clinician-rated instruments, as one provides the patient's perception of movement and the other may capture actual changes in performance. Research comparing the two indicates that utilization of both would result in the most comprehensive assessment approach that measures different aspects of balance impairments. All of the instruments can be administered in less than 20 minutes and are free, so it appears they would fit well into this clinical setting. The clinical bottom line for clinical utility includes more than just ensuring that the cost, length, and time required are suitable for a specific clinical situation. It is also important that the instrument being utilized matches the most important clinical question being asked by the patient and the clinician. Consider the organizational barriers and facilitators such as the ability for the medical record to support tracking of the measurements over time and selection of a variety of instruments. Also consider the support that may be provided by the leadership of the organization to spend portions of clinical time doing follow-up assessments. It is also important to note that every clinic has a different situation from an organizational and process perspective. Instruments that seem to fit well in one setting may not fit well into another because of the clinic's budget, barriers, time constraints, or current processes. If an instrument is being selected to use in multiple settings within one organization, it is important to include stakeholders from each of the settings and the decision so that these differences can be discussed. Let's move from clinical utility to the topic of reliability. Reliability in clinical measurement is about consistently using instruments with precision. However, instruments function differently under different circumstances and are less precise due to the greater variation in clinical settings. Clinicians constitute a critical part of the clinician rated instruments, so we want instruments with research studies that resemble our patients and settings. We must follow the administration protocol as closely as possible. Some important points to remember. Reliability coefficients are derived from samples. They are not attributes of the instrument that are unchangeable. They're based on the sample context. One needs to consider the methods, the demographic characteristics of the sample, and the conditions of interest, as well as the specific instrument. Some of the clinical considerations include how precise will this instrument measure the construct with my patient? What sources of error are relevant to use of this instrument with patients in my clinic? The bottom line, the best you can expect in a clinical setting is less reliability than would be obtained in a rigorous research setting. There are several types of reliability to consider. Depending upon the instrument and how we use it, we may have to consider up to four types of reliability. Multi-item instruments, like most patient-reported questionnaires, and some clinician-rated instruments, like the Berg Balance Scale, sum item scores into a total score. Adding items makes sense if the items measure aspects of the same construct, and a bigger number means more of that construct. Second, internal consistency. It provides an indication of how similar the items are to one another and is often reported with a coefficient called alpha that ranges between 0 and 1, where values between 0.7 and 0.9 are desirable. Next, intra and inter-rater reliability provide an indication of how consistently raters score patients on the instrument and are important for clinician-rated instruments. Rater reliability is typically reported with the interclass correlation coefficients or ICCs, which range between 0 and 1, or with other correlation coefficients that range between negative and positive 1. In controlled settings of research studies that generate reliability coefficients, an ICC of 0.8 might be considered reliable. Clinical practice is far more variable, so the ICC represents the best level that clinicians can expect in practice settings if they adhere closely to the protocol of the instrument. Consequently, we need to look for instruments that have higher coefficients, ideally in the 0.9 range. Test-retest reliability is important for evaluating change over time and provides an indication of how consistently scores can be repeated for patients who are not changing. Test-retest reliability is similar to intra-rater reliability, so we look for instruments with higher coefficients. A test-retest ICC has no unit of measurement and it can be used to estimate the margin of error for a score in the same units of the scale. The margin of error is called the standard error of measurement, or SEM for short. 
When assessing an instrument's reliability, it's critical to remember that the reliability coefficient is derived from a research study in which only a few raters were utilized and they're rigorously trained and testing conditions were kept as similar as possible. In the clinic, there's much more variability. Many clinicians may be involved in testing. Therefore, a reliability coefficient of 0.9 in the research setting is really the best it's likely to be in the clinic. In order to maximize reliability in the clinic, it's critical that a team of clinicians review, practice, and standardize an instrument routinely. Once an instrument is standardized within a group, it's still necessary to re-standardize regularly as people tend to drift from the standard administration of the instrument over time. Look for instruments with a reliability greater than 0.9 and internal consistency of greater than 0.7 on patients similar to those seen in your settings. For internal consistency, scores greater than 0.9 may indicate that the instrument has some redundancy. Given the time constraints in clinics, minimizing redundancy is of utmost importance. Going back to our case, in Frank's situation, it is very important to find a highly reliable instrument. Since Frank is being assessed in a clinic for inpatient admission, it is likely that this score will be the baseline score for many additional testing periods. It is also likely that different therapists will be conducting the tests and the variability with clinical practice is much higher than the variability in research. As Dr. Heinemann mentioned, we are looking for reliability coefficients that are higher than 0.9 because that is what it would be at best in a clinical situation if the clinicians were as rigorous as researchers with standardization. This table includes references that have sampled patients that are elderly and patients with Parkinson's disease because Frank could potentially be similar to patients studied in both types of studies. Since Frank has been classified as a Hohenjahr stage 3, he is beginning to demonstrate bilateral impairments but is still mostly independent. It is important to review the samples studied and the articles referenced to determine the Hohenjahr stages included in the PD studies and the impairment level of the patients in the elderly studies. The reliability coefficients listed within this table indicate that most of these instruments demonstrated very high reliability. The functional reach test demonstrated poor reliability, 0.74 for inter-rater and 0.64 for intra-rater in individuals with PD. The sample included in this study was very similar to Frank with honing error stages 1 to 3 and a mean 6.5 years duration. Based on these findings, it is best to eliminate this instrument. Based on the data available, it appears that intra-rater reliability for the Berg Balance Scale and PD has not been assessed. Missing psychometric data for specific populations is a common finding. In Frank's case, we would then look to the elderly data, which indicates excellent reliability of 0.98. The sample of elderly individuals included in the cited study published by Berg in 1989 included patients with varying diagnoses. The mean age of the population was 73 and 28% of them had Parkinson's disease. Given the, these sample characteristics, we feel it is close enough to consider for intra greater reliability in Frank's case. Another consideration for Frank's case is timing of test administration. According to one study, including the timed up and go, Reliability varied depending upon whether testing was performed while on or off medications. Since Frank is likely taking these types of medications, it is important to keep testing conditions consistent, which includes medication cycles. So based on these results, we are going to eliminate the functional reach test from the list of instruments being considered and continue to review the other four in this module. So in summary, when assessing an instrument's reliability, it is critical to remember that the reliability coefficient is derived from a research study in which only a few raters were utilized, and that they were likely rigorously trained and testing conditions were kept as similar as possible. In the clinical setting, much more variability exists and many clinicians may be involved in testing. Therefore, a reliability coefficient of 0.9 in the research is really the best it is likely to be in the clinic. In order to maximize reliability in, in the clinic, it is critical that a team of clinicians review and practice the standardized instrument routinely with each other. Once an instrument is standardized within a group of people, it is still necessary to re-standardize it regularly as people tend to drift from the standard administration.
And again, when looking for an instrument, please remember to look for instruments that have demonstrated reliability of greater than 0.9 in the research and internal consistency of greater than 0.7. Let's move now from a discussion of reliability to validity. Validity is defined as the extent to which a measure assesses what it is intended to measure. It's important to keep in mind that validity is an attribute of the application of a measure to a sample in a context. It's not an attribute of the measure itself. High reliability is a prerequisite to having adequate validity. Reliability coefficient of 0.9 defines the upper limit of what our validity coefficient may be. Hence, Reliability of 0.9, at best we're apt to get a validity coefficient of 0.8. Validity also requires that we think about the application of a instrument to a specific clinical situation. It goes without saying that we're not going to measure body weight with a postage meter, measure blood pressure on a child with a large cuff, or measure body temperature with a turkey thermometer. We have to select the right instrument for the right context. Validity has to do with how meaningful and trustworthy the interpretation of a given score is from a given measure for a given person or sample under a specific clinical context. Valid measurement requires that we choose the right instrument for the specific situation. In clinical practice, we can distill this abstract idea to finding the right instrument for the situation. In a clinical situation, we want an instrument that can measure the construct of interest for a specific patient in your clinical setting under a known set of circumstances with a valid range of scores to provide information that's useful to support clinical decision making. Some of the clinical decisions we need to consider is whether we're discriminating one patient from a larger sample, sometimes we're interested in predicting outcomes of services, and sometimes we're interested in evaluation of describing the patient's performance level. Validation coefficients can be produced in several different ways. If at the same time as the instrument we're interested in uh, evaluating, we've also administered comparable instruments, we would expect that the correlation coefficients would be high. If we've assessed a different construct, a different ability than the one we're interested in, we would expect low levels of correlation. Cross-sectional validation is done when the evaluation is done at one point in time. In contrast, predictive validity has to do with our success in predicting a future event accurately. Doing so requires that we consider the stability of patients over time and whether they will change as a result of treatment or as a result of change in their underlying neurological or other physical condition. The classical way of describing different types of validation are shown on the left-hand side of this screen. Face validity, content validity, criterion-related validity, and construct validity are the classical ways of describing these concepts. A more unified way is described recently by Messick, one of the key names in coming up with a unified concept of validity. Messick distinguished content, substantive, structural, generalizability, external, and consequential aspects of validity. We'll discuss those in detail in the next few slides. Content aspects of validity have to do with the relevance of the sample and the representativeness of the sample in relation to what it is we're trying to measure. Substantive aspects of validity have to do with the empirical evidence for the theoretical construct of interest. Structural aspects of validity have to do with the fidelity of the scoring structure to the structure of what it is we're attempting to measure. Generalizability has to do with the extent to which scores generalize across populations, settings, and tasks. External aspects of validity have to do with classical ideas of convergent, discriminant, and criterion-based evidence for the measure. In other words, how does this measure perform in comparison to similar or different measures? Again, we'd expect for convergent evidence of validity that our new measure will correlate highly with similar instruments. It will correlate weakly with instruments measuring different measures. And it's that pattern of correlation coefficients that's critical. Consequential aspects of validity have to do with the positive or negative and the intentional or unintentional consequences of use of the measure. Several aspects of uh, validation are listed on this slide. 
When discussing validity, we also need to think about floor and ceiling effects of an instrument. The scale range is an important aspect of valid measurement. Ideally, we want scores that fall in the mid-range of the scale. Scores that fall near the lower or higher ends of the scale, also called floor and ceiling, are not precise measurements. An observed score that is within the margin of error of the ceiling may represent a true score that is actually above the scale end. We show here the Berg balance scale with a margin of error of plus or minus three and a half points on an observed score. Consequently, the effective floor for single score on the scale is at 3.5 points. Any score less than this could represent a level of balance that is below the measurable floor. The effective ceiling is 52.5 points, and any score greater than this could represent a level of balance that is above the upper end of the scale. We'll cover how to estimate the margin of error shortly. Summarizing, here's the bottom line for validity. First, ensure that the instrument measures what it claims to measure by examining validity coefficients between the instrument and similar or different instruments. Second, ensure that the study sample characteristics are similar to the patients in your setting. And third, ensure that your patient's score lies within the valid scale range of the instrument, that is, outside of the margin of error for each end of the scale. Okay, now we are going to go back to the case of Frank and examine the validity of the instruments that we have selected. Examining the validity coefficient for the re remaining four instruments can provide some insight into the actual aspects of balance that they measure. Ideally, a validity coefficient should be greater than 0.6 for instruments that measure similar constructs. The instruments listed on this table include the instruments that assess gait, static balance, dynamic balance, and fear of falling. Reviewing the validity results from the research can provide us with information about what construct each of these instruments actually measure. This information can help us be confident that we are assessing what we want to assess. The Berg balance scale appears to have acceptable correlations with the functional reach test, which is a static balance measure. It also has a strong correlation with the functional gait assessment, which is a dynamic balance measure. Moderate to strong correlations are demonstrated with fear of fall falling measures. An excellent correlation is demonstrated with the BUS test, which assesses various aspects of balance deficits. Given this data, it appears that the Berg balance scale assesses both static and dynamic balance in the PD population. The Activity Specific Balance Confidence Scale also has a strong correlation with the Bird Balance Scale in Parkinson's disease. Additionally, it has a strong correlation with the fear of falling measure in a similar elderly population. This indicates that it may assess a different aspect of balance than static or dynamic balance. However, fear of falling or balance confidence could play a role in Frank's falling. The dynamic gait index will be eliminated because it has not been tested in Parkinson's disease, and there are other acceptable measures that could be utilized. The timed up and go will be eliminated because it doesn't appear to correlate well with other static or dynamic balance measures. The results of the validity comparison indicate that we should continue to assess only the Berg balance scale since it assesses two areas of interest, static and dynamic balance. The ABC may also be considered because it assesses a different but possibly important aspect of balance related to falls. There is limited data on floor and ceiling effects for both the Berg and the ABC in Parkinson's disease. However, you can assess whether your patient is likely to encounter a floor or ceiling effect after your initial assessment. You simply determine whether the initial score is within the margin of error for either test end. If it is, the patient would likely encounter a floor or ceiling effect on the scale. It would be best to select an alternate test if you wish to use the instrument to measure changes over time. To summarize the clinical bottom line for validity, there are a few main points to remember. Ensure that the instrument measures what you think it measures by examining validity coefficients between the instrument and similar or different instruments. Also ensure the study sample is similar to your patient and that your patient scores are outside of the margin of error of each scale end for the instrument. Our final topic in this module is predicting outcomes. The same instruments that we use to monitor change can be used to predict change as well.
Doing so requires that we've accumulated assessments for many patients and can analyze them statistically. We can also use published studies with similar patients that depict the course of improvement that can be expected in clinical settings. We want to make sure that we select articles reporting outcomes for patients that are similar to yours. Results from different samples may not generalize to your patient. Measurable change must be detectable with the instrument used in a similar sample. Plan to reassess when change greater than MDC is expected. You can reassess at specific time points, for example, weekly team meetings, even if change is not expected. Change greater than the MCID is clinically important. You can plot the scores over time to monitor or to illustrate the plot of recovery. Now we are going to put all of this together with one final case. Lucille is a 79-year-old female who lives alone in a two-story home. She was referred for outpatient occupational and speech therapy because of noticeable deficits in ex executive function. Complaints include increasing forgetfulness as reported by her daughter, frequent errors with bill pain, difficulty preparing meals, and concerns that she is not taking her medications correctly. Her daughter reports that she is thinking of having the patient move in with her, but she works full time. She is also considering assisted living if more supervision is needed. The patient's goals are to understand the current deficits and their impact on her function and living situation. Additionally, she would like to improve independence in above areas. For Lucille, we need to find an instrument that enables us to establish current status and understand the extent of deficits, determine assistance required for daily living, and monitor improvements or decline in cognitive function. In our search for tests, we select cognition for area of assessment, geriatrics for diagnosis, no preference for length of test, and no preference for cost. Our search resulted in four cognition instruments and three executive function instruments. The four cognition instruments included the mini mental status exam, the kettle test, the short orientation memory concentration test of cognitive impairment, and the executive function performance test. Three of these four instruments also resulted from the executive function search. We first compared the clinical utility of the instruments. We eliminated the mini mental status exam and the OMC because they were both screening tools and may not provide the depth of information required to answer the primary questions of understanding the amount of assistance required to perform daily tasks and discrimination of current cognitive status. Additionally, the screening tools would not provide a method to measure change over time. So this narrows the list to the cattle test and the executive function performance test. When comparing these measures for reliability, there is very little literature to compare. Study populations included are acute and chronic stroke. Given that acute stroke patients are likely experiencing spontaneous recovery and rapid change, the chronic population would be more similar to Lucille. However, sample characteristics of age and educational level should also be reviewed to understand the applicability to Lucille's case since these are both factors that contribute to executive function. Reliability is higher for the executive function performance test than the kettle test, and it is above the 0.9 threshold for the reliability coefficient for clinical utilization. This indicates that the executive function performance test may have better reliability for this particular clinical situation. The kettle test has been tested in the elderly population for validity. It has an acceptable correlation with mini mental status exam, which is a cognitive impairment screen. The test has a fairly strong correlation of 0.59 with a fact drawing test, which is a test of visual, spatial, and praxis ability, and may determine the presence of both attention and executive dysfunctions. The test has a poor correlation with the star cancellation test, which assesses unilateral visual neglect. This is an expected result since this is not a construct that the Kettle test attempts to measure. The population in this study had a mean age of 75 and was referred secondary to, to suspected cognitive deficits. The EFPT has been tested in acute and chronic stroke for validity. 
The test, the test listed on the table for chronic stroke results indicate that EFPT potentially assesses a different aspect of executive function than the comparison measures. These measures generally assess executive function using a paper and pen test. However, acceptable correlations were demonstrated with story recall and digits backwards. In summary, this data indicates that the Kettle test demonstrated validity in a similar elderly population. The EFPT may have acceptable validity in a chronic stroke population, but it hasn't been tested in the elderly. One of the limitations to both of these instruments is that they can only be administered one time because learning could occur during test administration. This would adversely impact the test's ability to measure change from an intervention since two tests cannot be performed on one patient. SEM and MDC have not been established. Floor and ceiling effects also have not been ass assessed for these measures. Let's review and summarize what we have focused on during this module today. There's issues of reliability, issues of validity, MCIDs, and MDCs. Being able to answer these questions assures that you've grasped the key essentials from this presentation. It's also helpful to identify what sources of error exist in rehabilitation measures, what potential sources of bias exist, and how you can reduce that error and reduce the potential for bias. Also consider the sources of errors that exist in rehabilitation measures, both for patient reported instruments and clinician rated instruments. Consider the potential sources of bias for both PROs and clinician rated instruments and give thought to what you can do to reduce measurement error and the potential for biased measurement. We made reference to several key articles as we have proceeded through this module by Baum, Berg, and Donahue. Those references are listed here. We also had citations to Gonzalez Fernandez, Shumway Cook, and to Stefan. They're listed here. This concludes the third module in this series.